Praise the Lord. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Having time to read the whole chapter, uh, I'll take from verse um, 38. Verse 38. And then we'll quietly sing, Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Really? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet were bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to, to them, Unbind him, and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Kephas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should not be should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on they took counsel how to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer went about openly among the Jews, but went from there to the country near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know, so they might arrest him. This is the word of God. Let's sing our chorus quietly in prayer. Hmm. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach me more about his lovely name? Right. Thank you. Now we get into this chapter. Uh, a number of you were away last night on outreach and so on. Um, it would help if you took time, whenever you can, to pick up the first part of the chapter, we divided it, I'll just, I haven't time to go back through the whole thing, but we divided it, you get where you are in your notes in your outline, and we divided this chapter into four parts. In the outline, it is um, the controversy concluded. And uh, we've divided it into four parts. It all centers around the raising of Lazarus. The occasion of the miracle, verses 1 through 16, if you didn't have this last night, it would be well to put it down. The occasion of the miracle, verses 1 through 16. The approach to it, verses 17 to 32. The performance of it, verses 33 to 44. And the consequences of it, verse 45 to 47, 57. Those four sections of the chapter as a whole, a wonderful chapter in God's Word. 
The occasion of it, verse 1 to 16. The approach to it, verse 17 to 32. The performance of it, verse 33 to 44. The consequences of it, verse 45 to 57. And last night we didn't get any further than the occasion of the miracle. <coughs> the occasion of it. Verses 1 through 16. Now today let's turn to the, what I call the approach to the miracle. Verses 17 to 32. The approach to the miracle. It's important that you look at the first 16 verses because we saw the confidence of these, this home in a crisis and um, why they were confident and their claim upon Jesus and how they made the claim and then the challenge to their faith. Jesus stayed where he was an extra two days. Now the approach to the miracle, what, a, what an interesting study it is in two sisters, Martha and Mary. You get the picture a little more clearly if you remember the other incident concerning them. If you look just for a second at Luke chapter 10, we find them again there, Luke chapter 10. Verse 38. Now as they went on their way, he entered the village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. <laughs> Mary, that um, chapter says in Luke, Mary was distracted with much serving. If you've got the King James Version, it says Mary was cumbered about with much serving. That's a bit, uh, Martha, I beg your pardon. That's a bit uh, archaic, cumbered about with much serving. On the other hand, I'm not very happy with the Living Bible. If any of you have this, um, it says Martha was one of the jittery kind. Well, I don't think that's quite fair to her, quite frankly. Uh, I don't like that very much. I think saying, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. I think that uh, Martha was in danger of what we were talking about last night, this failure to recognize in her life the necessity of being in and out, the in and out life. I should say that Martha did, as well as thought, but uh, Mary thought, I'm sorry, I'm getting things wrong around. Mary did as well as thought, but Martha thought less than she did. She didn't stop to think before she did something. And these characteristics of the two come out in John chapter 11. Mary did, as well as thought, but Martha thought less than she did. And here in John 11, <laughs> it's amazing really, how trouble often results in a new understanding of the Lord Jesus. Trouble results in a new understanding, a revelation of Christ. We never see the rainbow, but for the storm. And notice in verse 26, 25 and 26, what Jesus says. I am another of his claims got them all he's made several more in this gospel 
I am, a phrase that's unique to John, I am. Here it ends. Got the others. You better watch it and you have them. Right. Here's another one. Tremendous claim. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. And whoever, li whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Do you believe this? Martha expected something from Jesus. Verse 21. If you had not been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She was expecting something from Christ. The greatest truth about the Lord Jesus, he is, he hasn't, simply he hasn't got what we need, but he is what we need. Not the gift, but the giver. He just, it's not that he has what I need. He is what I need. is isn't point to some future gift, but to himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Get this down, I've just got slurry. Resurrection isn't a future prospect. It's a life-giving power for today. A life-giving power incarnate in Jesus. Incarnate in Jesus in us. So may I repeat. Resurrection, not a distant prospect, but a life-giving power incarnate in Christ right now. Colossians 3.3 3, You have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's it. Life is hid with Christ in God. Resurrection life. So if I'm alive in Jesus, I shouldn't live in a grave. Notice how Martha's faith became. Well, it was a very little faith that became great here. What she'd learned from trouble. I'll give this. Just put it down, will you? Fine. She had a new grasp of faith. Verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Verse 27. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's come into the world. Her faith took a great big leap forward. I know that you are Christ, the Son of God. Martha's faith took a big leap forward. And therefore she had a new grasp of Jesus. It was something new for her to say that. She was ready to receive that word from the Lord and she went right away to call her sister and said to her, verse 28, 
the, the teacher or the master is here and is calling for you. A great step forward as a result of trouble. A great step forward in our faith. Now look at the performance of the miracle. What a situation at the graveside of Lazarus. Everybody's crying. When Jesus, 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, that is Mary, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see, and Jesus wept. Just look at that. The sisters weep, the Jews weep, and Jesus weeps, but for a different reason. Verse 35, notice this, the tears of Christ made them all say, look how he loved Lazarus. But they were wrong. Oh yes, he loved him. But that wasn't why he cried. He's got, to, he's got to raise him from the dead again in a few minutes. So he wasn't crying because of Lazarus. i tell you why he's crying. Because he loved Martha, Mary, and the Jews, who would not learn the lesson he wanted to teach them. His tears were not for Lazarus, but for unbelief. Get there. Verse 35 again. Jesus, deeply moved in spirit, troubled and wept. And they all said, Look, he's crying. How he must have loved him. But it wasn't crying because he loved Lazarus. Because they wouldn't learn the lesson he wanted to teach them. It was unbelief that made Jesus weep. And, oh, oh let this down. And it is unbelief which is so often exposed in our in the discipline of delay. Let me repeat that. It's unbelief which is often exposed in our lives in the discipline of delay. When Jesus doesn't turn up, when he doesn't give me instant healing or instant blessing, or do something for me instantly, it's unbelief that is exposed in the discipline of delay. He was about to do something they couldn't do. But you notice, he won't do what they could do. Verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Verse 39. He was about to do something they couldn't do, but he wouldn't do what they could do. Get that. And today, answer some of your prayers. 
answer some of your own prayers by doing what you can do. Just don't sit around and expect him to guide and do something for you when well, you can do something yourself. There's some tremendous words here in verse 33, sorry, verse 43 and 44. Lazarus, oh, just look at it. And when he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, hands and feet bound with bandages, face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. <laughs> Great words. As a matter of fact, I'm rather sorry for poor old Lazarus, but he had to go through the same thing again, presumably, a few years later. <laughs> What a wretched experience, have to, have to go through all that twice. <laughs> Not many people do that. <laughs> Dead, alive, bound, then free. That's great. Dead, alive, bound, and free. If all Christians who are bound were to get free, from their grave clothes the world would sit up and listen this is never done don't be an enslaved Christian <coughs> he who can release us from death can release us from sin <coughs> may that be your experience dead alive bound free great words the performance of the miracle <clears throat> poor old Lazarus look at the consequences of the miracle now verses 45 to 57 I've given to you just in three short paragraphs. First, a division of opinion. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What shall we do? For this man performs many signs a division of opinion which represents faith in verse 45 and unbelief in verse 46 and when the Lord passes by you've got to be on one side or the other a division of opinion which represents faith on the one hand and unbelief on the other. And you notice the Sanhedrin or the Jewish rulers, they commit themselves. Verse 47 to 43. 47 to 53. What a bunch they were. There's a sort of tragic humor in, in uh, what they said. Verses 47 and 48. This man performed many signs. If we let him go, if we let him go on us, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. They admitted much. They anticipated worse, more, and they thought badly. Now just, just jot that down and we'll observe that. They admitted much. This man performs many signs. They anticipated more. If they let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him. <laughs> and they argued badly. The Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation.
But um, a man named Cephas, who was high priest, tried to come to the rescue. But he's a very subtle guy. One of Cephas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You don't understand the expedient for you that one man should die for the people, better that way, that the, and that the whole nation should not perish. Let's just pause that a moment, because the rest is John's commentary on what he said. He said, uh, you know nothing at all. You don't understand the expedient for you that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should not perish. Never for a moment allow yourself to think that he had any sympathy with Christ. I'll just give you time to jot that down. Never allow yourself to think that this man had any sympathy with the Lord. Nor that he understood what he was saying. What Caiaphas was saying himself. Didn't understand it. He was uh, making a suggestion. <coughs> suggestion was this. Better make a victim of Jesus. <coughs> For if we do wrong, we might prevent a popular rising and also show our zeal for the honor of Roman Empire and Caesar you see it's expedient for you better for you that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish better let Jesus die better make a victim of him so prevent a popular rising and show our zeal for the honor of, of Caesar that was his way of hiding interest in himself playing it safe under the cloak of being a patriot under pretense. And verses 51 and 52 are John's expansion of what he was saying. John says this was a memorable a memorable day verse 53 so from that day they took counsel how to put him to death I can't forget that it was a memorable year too verse 49 because Kephas who was high priest that year in verse 51 he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year. What a year it was. And what a day it was that took counsel to put him to death. I can't forget that. And it's tough to think that sometimes, always in life, there's one year, another year, and another, which is, you can't forget. It's a memorable year. And there's a day in that year when something happens. A real crisis. Two years ago, a student was here, Cape Ring, fellow, and uh, we had a chat together. And I noticed he brought with him, whenever we did have a chat, a big book. A great big book. And I was so intrigued about this book because it seemed to get bigger 
every time I saw him. And I, I ventured to ask him, I say, what's that book? Oh, he said, that's my spiritual diary. Would you like to look at it? So I said, thanks. And I looked at it. I've never read anything so marvelous. I said, brother, brother, never, never lose that book. And keep on writing it. Your spiritual diary. Because when you get to my hairy old age, when you get to my old age, wow, you look back on that. And what a biography of what Jesus has been to you for years and years and years. Keep a spiritual diary. Some days you'll never forget. Some years, very special. As you look back on them, you don't look at them now like that, but you'll look back on them. That was the year that was. That was the day that was. Ooh, I can never forget it. Get me? You can get a spiritual diary at Woolworths. Get a loose leaf edition. And you can enlarge it year by year. And it'll be thrilling reading. And one day you'll write your biography and everybody will just marvel not at you but um, like Hudson Taylor the growth of a soul his diary days when he wept on the beach at Brighton threatened to give up being a missionary to turn home give it all up pack it in no use and then suddenly he saw it's not what Hudson Taylor does for God that matters. It's what God does in and through Hudson Taylor. And that changed his whole life. You can read it. It's in the library. No, it isn't. It was last week. I've got it out at the moment. <coughs> It'll be back. <laughs> but, uh, oh, you can't let these books just happen it. Now, what's all that about? Oh, yes. Here we are. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> this division of opinion now just look in conclusion at um, both these lots of people standing by verses 54 to 57 there they are Jesus and his disciples are at Ephraim and the Jews are at Jerusalem a moment of suspense they thought to put an end to Jesus. Verse 53. From that day they took counsel how to put him to death. You might as well, you might as well puff at the sun. Or take a brush down to Morecambe Bay to keep the tide back. As try to put an end to Jesus. There's nothing so stupid, so powerless as unbelief. Nothing so powerless. And you know, would you believe it? Verse 55, they were going to purify themselves. Huh. Purify themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't clean your heart when you wash your hands. Pure heart, skin is no good if it hides an unclean heart. But look here at the tremendous effect of confrontation with Jesus. I want you to get this this down. I'm saying down fast. When when a confrontation with Christ happens, some people engage in mere talk. Verse forty six. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done mere talk and believe believe any action to religious experts some people just chat believe all the action to religious experts they told Jesus they told the Pharisees what he had done and some people are afraid of vested interests verse 47 and 48 what are we to do? Let him go on like this? Everyone will believe in him. He'll come and destroy a holy place and nation. 
some people afraid of vested interests. Jesus may upset my bank account, my career, my ambition, etc. What am I to do? More, that's another lot. No, another lot here. Some people seek an easy way out. Verse 49 and 50, that's key for us. By sacrificing truth for expediency. They seek an easy way out because they sacrifice truth for expediency. Some people cling to ceremony. Verse 55 and 56. The Passover was at hand. And he went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Cling to ceremony. Maintain the trappings of religion. Verse 55. Without having any commitment to Christ. Verse 56. The effect, this is the effect of, the different effects of confrontation with Christ. Some people join Jesus' followers. Verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. There are two things which win the answer outsider. Two things. Personal friendship. This 45. Many of the Jews who had come with Mary. personal friendship and seeing what Jesus does. They had come with Mary and had seen what he did and they believed in him. Now, we've got all those things because I want you to write one little sentence underneath it. The effect it is of personal confrontation with Christ. You see it all in this chapter, if you think into it. I'll just give them again quickly, right? Some people engage in mere talk, verse 46. Leave all the action to religious experts. Some people are afraid of vested interests. Or 47, 48. Jesus may upset my bank account. Ambition. Career, etc. Some people seek an easy way out. Verse 49 and 50. By sacrificing truth for expediency. It's expedient for us. Some people cling to ceremony. Maintaining the trappings of religion. Why? Some people find that desperately hard to give up. The trappings of religion. Verse 55. Without having any personal commitment to Christ. Some are Jesus, join Jesus' followers. Verse 45. They came with Mary. Two things which win an outsider for Christ. Personal friendship. Truth. 
tragic when you hear Christian people say, we don't have any un unconverted friends. Tragic when you're brought up in a Christian primary school, Christian day school, and go to a Christian college, and a Christian university, and then turn up to preach the word without ever having known how the other side of the fence lives. Never have we known it. Don't be afraid to identify with people. It's making friends of people. That counts. And seeing what Jesus does. Now the sentence that I want you to conclude with, and you put it down in your notes, is this. Lord, may it be clearly seen what you've done in my life. Let it be clearly seen what you've done in my life. A friend of mine was going to take a, an evangelistic campaign in Norwich. You know where Norwich is? Norwich. East Coast. And uh, he was going to stay with a very lovely family, Brethren, the capital B. Beautiful home. Husband and wife. But they had in their home a German girl who was um, au pair girl. You know what I mean by that? Somebody had come in to look after the home, etc. In response, in return for learning the language and the customs and so on. Well, she was there and uh, she hated it. Absolutely loathed it. Being in a religious atmosphere, in a godly home, hated it. He said, they squirmed on it, wanted to get out of it loathed it all but um, she had to go ahead with it so before this preacher came he said we have a preacher coming next week and we want him to have red carpet treatment we want to be sure to get the best beet, best stuff from the store uh, when you go and order it so she went on that Saturday morning before he'd come and she ordered the beet and she gave absolute details of every bit of the carcass she had to take home the butcher was very intrigued she said, uh, he said, have you somebody very important coming today? Oh, he said, no. So she said, no, it's only some preacher or other. Oh. And then she took the parcel of meat and went out the door. She turned and, and sort of flung at him. You'd think the Lord was coming, the fuss they're making. Slammed the door behind her. He was quite intrigued. My friend was in the home for a week. And then she came back to order the meat for the next weekend. And the butcher recognized her. And she said, by the way, how are you getting on with that friend, that preacher friend? No, she said, do you remember I said, you think the Lord was coming? Oh, he said, I sure did. No, she said, yes, he came. That was all. One man, one ordinary person, came. And Jesus, he, she saw through him the fact, the loveliness of Christ. And she was born again. That's what people need to say, isn't it? I hope that when you go to all those homes, that's what people will see. And that's what counts. May they see Christ and what he's done. Praise God. Father, the things we've been talking about are absolutely impossible. It's not a difficult life to live. It's impossible. You're the only one who can live it. By your grace. In lives that are utterly abandoned to all the will of God. Lord, answer prayer. For your name's sake. Amen.